So if you remember in the earlier parts of this course, we've talked about how electrons can't have any energy they like around an atom because they're basically probability waves. And like any waves on a guitar string, they can have one oscillation, two oscillations, three oscillations when they're confined, which correspond to different energy levels. And as we've just said, when an electron jumps down from the high energy to low energy, it will emit a photon whose energy is equal to the difference between the electron energy levels. So it comes out at a particular wavelength. So, so imagine we have a bunch of gas full of hydrogen. And for some reason, we're able to excite the hydrogen. That is, we can inject energy into that hydrogen so that some of the electrons go up to level three. Then just do the laws of probability of an atom. They're going to go down to two. And when they do, they'll emit a photon at that um, H alpha, as we like to call it, uh, the red wavelength. And so every time that happens, you're going to get emission. And so if you have a bunch of gas, you would expect to see emission at all of the energy levels that are excited within the atom. Yeah, so how are you going to heat up gas or um, excite gas to bring the electrons up to high levels? Well, in the case of a, you know, a neon sign, you go through and plug it in and put a lot of energy into it. But you can imagine a star might do it by giving ultraviolet photons or you could heat the gas up and then the collisions of the objects, to each, the atoms into each other, would knock the uh, electrons up into new levels. Okay, so if you ever get gas and you either zap it with ultraviolet or flood it through with particles like in a neon sign or you heat it up, that will excite the electrons and as they jump back down the levels they will produce a whole bunch of emission lines. And we have to be clear that uh, we describe this in what we call the optically thin regime. That's where none of the atoms talk to the other atoms. And so the light being emitted yeah. here just keeps going and never sees another atom. OK, so this is one situation. It might yeah. explain what's happening in our um, mysterious object when that's at low state. You seem to have a cloud of gas that's somehow being heated up or zapped or something. Yep. Um, but this, as I said, is optically thin when the light electrons jump down, they emit a photon, and it just goes straight out. Yep. But in practice, um, you, if you have a very thick gas cloud, that's not going to happen. Because in addition to the photon being emitted, it can also be absorbed. If an electron jumps from level 3 to doom and produces an H-alpha photon, that's just the same energy if it's another hydrogen atom to bump it back up from level 2 to level 3 again and absorb it. And so then you wouldn't see anything, right? You'd go through and you'd produce something, yeehaw, but then you'd run into another atom and yeehaw. And you end up with nothing. So what you can think about is how far on average a photon is going to get before it gets absorbed. And that will depend on the density of the gas. If the gas is a very low density, it maybe can escape clean out the other side. And we're in the optically thin case. If, on the other hand, the gas is denser or just bigger, um, then it's going to be optically thick. So let's say, for example, this is a typical distance a photon can get before it hits another hydrogen atom and is absorbed. Mm -hmm. The only emission we're going to see from a cloud is from this front region. If an atom there, jumps, an electron jumps down from 3 to 2, the photon can get out. If it does it from here, it will get as far as there, maybe get absorbed again. Yep. So, we're so we, see... we sort of call this as the optical depth. That means it's sort of where you know the average uh, photon comes from. That's the depth within the stuff that it can escape. It's not going to be an absolutely sharp line. Right. Uh, it's a random process. So there'll be some photons from here that don't escape and some from there that do. But it's the ones well inside this mostly will escape. And then the probability of escaping will go down until by the time you're way over here, the probability is very, very low. And, and there's a very good analogy that we have in normal life, which is on a foggy day, it's sort of how far you can see before things completely get obliterated. And this line sort of represents just the last little thing you can see. That's how far through the fog you can see. But of course, this uh, optical depth, how far you can see, is going to depend on the wavelength you're looking at. Because bear in mind, all the laws of physics are reversible. They go both ways around. Yeah. So let's say you take this wavelength, the wavelength of, say, the H alpha line or any other line. This is, say, a, there's a, a transition. Lots of electrons are going to be in the state to make that transition. So it's going to radiate an awful lot. So if you get a given, say, cubic volume of gas, it's going to emit a lot of that wavelength. But because there are a lot of electrons in those states, it's also going to absorb a lot at those wavelengths. So at this wavelength, the optical depth is going to be very short. So we're only going to see the radiation coming from a very small region at the front. But let's say you look at a different wavelength, like this one down here, where there aren't any particular transitions that match it. In that case, the gas doesn't emit very much, only very little about per unit volume. But on the other hand, it's not going to absorb very much. So you get a very large region of the gas cloud, um, which is transparent. Right. So that means that 
if you're looking at something in hydrogen that at that specific red wavelength of the hydrogen alpha transition, that 3 to 2 transition, you can only see a little bit, and then you move off that transition, you can see a long ways into the material. And so it's sort of what you see depends on exactly the color you, you are looking at, and that's actually quite an interesting way to diagnose what's going on. Yeah, so you wouldn't actually expect to see a spectrum like this. You've got two effects going the opposite way. On one hand, at this wavelength, it's emitting like crazy, but you're only going to see a tiny bit. On this place, it's only emitting pathetically, but you're seeing a huge amount. So you'd expect the two to kind of cancel out. And in fact, you can do the calculation. You can assume the radiation is in equilibrium with the matter. This is a calculation done by Planck in the late 19th century. And yep. it turns out in this case, you completely lose all these emission lines. You actually get a very smooth spectrum, what's called a black body curve. And that smooth spectrum turns out depends on the temperature of the material, how fast the atoms or the material is moving around effectively. It only depends on that. It doesn't yeah. matter anymore what the thing's made out of because all the emission lines are cancelled out. If you've got an emission line, yes, you emit more of that wavelength, but you can only see less of it, and so that cancels out. So in some sense, it's great. You learn the temperature, but you, and it's very simple, but you lose all the richness of information about what the com composition is. And you can see that if you have something hot, so something, for example, substantially hotter than our sun, it's going to emit a lot of blue light or even ultraviolet light. So this one's peeking down around in the near ultraviolet, about right. 350 nanometers. So that's so blue you can't even see the light with your eye. And something cooler than our sun, for example, 4,000 degrees Kelvin, produces a lot of red light. And indeed, a lot of light you can't also see with your eye. And our eyes are magically trained through evolution to be very sensitive to about the temperature of the sun, where the sun puts out most of its light. So you can write down an equation for this. We'll show you this in the reference notes. It's a fairly complicated equation. Um, you can take two simple derivatives of that equation. One of them is to work out what wavelength things peak at. This is called the VN displacement law. So what this means is if you have a particular temperature, you can work out what wavelength the black body curve should peak. Uh, or you go the other way around. If you know what wavelength it's peaking at, you work out what the temperature is. The second thing you can derive from that is one we've seen before many times in different uh, courses in the series, which is the Stefan Boltzmann equation. You can add up the total amount of power radiated per unit area, and it depends only on the area and the temperature. And it goes the temperature is the fourth yeah. power. So hot things are really bright when it comes to how much energy they put out. So that's given us a flat continuum spectrum, and it's given us a spectrum with emission lines. How about a spectrum with absorption lines? How are we going to get one of those? Well, this is kind of an interesting idea. So imagine, for some reason, that I have one of those black bodies, and it's shining through gas. So then I'm going to be putting photons at all sorts of energies, and some of those energies are going to line up with the wavelength of hydrogen in that 3 to 2 transition, 4 to 2 transition, which means that that light would be taken out of the black body, or the continuum, as we say, and you would get absorption at those specific wavelengths. So what you need is a optically thick thing, which is emitting something like a black body in the background, yep. and then in front, some optically thin gas. Yep. Um, and this could actually often be the same gas cloud. This could, for example, in our case of our sun, this would be the deep regions of the sun, and this would yep. be the cool surface regions of the sun. That's right, and so that's a, a very good way to get absorption lines. And it sort of tells you that you have a thin layer of stuff that's relatively, uh, it turns out, cool relative to the stuff in the background. Okay, so that's how you get emission lines, continuum, and absorption lines. In the next video, we'll go and apply this to what we've learned about this uh, strange exploding star.